science plays a vital role for economic development and societal well-being. Understanding this, the Academy of Sciences Malaysia was established with a mission to be Malaysia's thought leader in all areas of science, technology and innovation. To realize its mission, ASM harnesses the nation's top scientific minds to chart the STI direction and facilitates the implementation of an innovation-led economy for the country. ASM's commitment lies firmly in fostering a culture of excellence in STI in Malaysia. ASM does this by providing independent, credible, relevant and timely STI input of national and international importance to the country. Our network of expertise comprises Malaysian scientists, engineers and technologists who specialize in various disciplines. The Academy assists in upgrading the nation's technological capabilities in the industrial sectors by producing high-quality publications such as peer-reviewed journals, monographs and books. In addition, ASM also provides input on current and future technology trends to be considered and taken up by the government in driving the nation's economy forward. To provide Malaysian scientists with the best opportunities and exposure, ASM actively extends its international networks and collaborations. It currently has a range of multilateral engagements with renowned scientific institutions worldwide. The Academy also champions the need to grow the right talent in STI by cultivating interests in science, technology, engineering and mathematics to the younger generation. In short, the Academy's ethos is broadly defined as Think Science, Celebrate Technology, Inspire Innovation.
science plays a vital role for economic development and societal well-being. Understanding this, the Academy of Sciences Malaysia was established with a mission to be Malaysia's thought leader in all areas of science, technology and innovation. To realize its mission, ASM harnesses the nation's top scientific minds to chart the STI direction and facilitates the implementation of an innovation-led economy for the country. ASM's commitment lies firmly in fostering a culture of excellence in STI in Malaysia. ASM does this by providing independent, credible, relevant and timely STI input of national and international importance to the country. Our network of expertise comprises Malaysian scientists, engineers and technologists who specialize in various disciplines. The Academy assists in upgrading the nation's technological capabilities in the industrial sectors by producing high-quality publications such as peer-reviewed journals, monographs and books. In addition, ASM also provides input on current and future technology trends to be considered and taken up by the government in driving the nation's economy forward. To provide Malaysian scientists with the best opportunities and exposure, ASM actively extends its international networks and collaborations. It currently has a range of multilateral engagements with renowned scientific institutions worldwide. The Academy also champions the need to grow the right talent in STI by cultivating interests in science, technology, engineering and mathematics to the younger generation. In short, the Academy's ethos is broadly defined as Think Science, Celebrate Technology, Inspire Innovation. Dada ne amal khub sundar city dili. Karcha pan kami, saglas kami vai lagle ne amala ba bachet zali paisa chhi. Aashi padatas lite ya ke kar kai do ne kar lau shakato. Ata purus ne slate re ami vai la zamin lau shakato. Bandi kasaji, pani baraycha, shen baraycha, the amala karu saglas shetau zaycha. Saglas kastha ata vaslam. मैंने पूर्ण अपने मुझे ये सर्टी चाह माला आधारत जाली लाये। ये सर्टी बदल दी मुझे खर्च कमी, पारंपरिक खर्च जास्ता। आठ मुमात मैं एक फायदा सा होता कि निश्चित और अवलम्बन हार होता पारंपरिक बदल दिया पावुस पानी हो गया रहस। तो ऐसा मत राव लगता। खूब सुंदर अच्छा कि इतने या शेता मुझे आलानंतर Good afternoon and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for attending the session. Um, Frontier Technologies in Tropical Agriculture. Um, as you know, the impact of climate change on tropical agriculture has led to significant reduction in growth periods of most crops together with dr a dramatic increase in weather variability and extreme events like floods, hurricanes, and droughts. For this reason, there has been a more intensive focus by farmers towards building climate resilience agricultural techniques and programs, as well as the demands of new technologies to enable farmers to achieve sustainable intensification and approach to agriculture that increases food production while minimizing impacts on the environment. So frontier technologies, such as the use of big AI 
big data, AI, IoT, et cetera, are key drivers to developing new farming technologies. For example, extremely large sets of data collected on climate conditions, crop genetics, can be used to develop forecasts to make planting recommendations to address climate variability in food production. Additionally, if fully tapped, these technologies have also the potential to optimize the use of resources, among others, land, labor, fertilizers, pesticides, and water, leading to sustainable practices in the tropics. It is my privilege to have very four uh, experts in their own field uh, in this set panel session, and I would hope that the uh, members of the audience would participate uh, later with questions uh, to, in order for us to gain more knowledge from their expertise. So I call on the first um, speaker, Mr. Jack Bobo. He's the CEO, CEO of Futurity, a food foresight company, and the author of Why Smart People Make Bo Bad Food Choices. Uh, this is recognized by Scientific American in 2015 as one of the uh, one of the hundred most influential people in biotechnology. Uh, Mr. Jack Bobo uh, is an attorney with a scientific background, and he has received a JD from Indiana University with a Master of Science in Environmental Science, in Bachelor's in Biotechnology, BA in Psychology and Chemistry. So, with that, I present to you. Mr. Jack Bobo, please. Thank you, and thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, I'm more interested in quantity of degrees, but my wife has the PhD in molecular biology in our family, so she's more about quality. And I know that the rest of the speakers are really focused on the quality of their science as well. Uh, today, I'd like to actually um, set the stage a little bit for the other speakers to follow. Uh, you already mentioned that there are many challenges that agriculture faces today in terms of drought and limited water resources or too much water in some places that climate change and climate variability are making it harder every day for farmers to do their jobs. Uh, but I would also like to mention that there are significant impacts of agriculture on the planet as well. If we were to talk about land, <laughs> 40% uh, of all the land on the planet is already being used for agriculture. The amount of cropland is the size of South America, the amount of pasture land, the size of Africa. So in terms of land, there's nothing more important than agriculture. If we were to talk about water, 70% of all fresh water goes to agriculture. Uh, the Aral Sea, one of the largest seas in Central Asia, no, uh, is almost disappeared. The Colorado River, the fifth largest river in America, no longer flows to the sea. So dramatic challenges in terms of water, and that's today. It'll only get worse. If we were to talk about climate change, 10 to 15 percent of greenhouse gases come from agriculture. Another 10 to 15 percent come from deforestation, 80 percent of which is caused by agriculture. So the footprint of agriculture is large. So the challenge that we face is to maintain and grow the benefits and reduce those negatives. In addition to that, of course, there are the challenges of biodiversity loss. The biggest driver of loss of biodiversity is also agriculture. So we have these challenges that we need to face. In addition to that, we have 800 million people who will go to bed tonight hungry. That's unacceptable in a world today to have so many people, and it's dramatically worse than it was just a year and a half ago before COVID hit when we were down to less than 700 million. So for 50 years, the situation was getting better and now it's getting worse. So we need to find a way of addressing that. And then there are an additional 2 billion people who don't have enough food to eat, um, but don't rise to the level of that significant hunger. Looking forward, we can expect an additional one and a half to 2 billion people on the planet by 2050. We're gonna go from 7.8 billion to nine and a half or 10 billion people by 2050. And incomes will be rising over that time horizon. So we'll need between 50 and 60% more food than we have today. And yet our rivers and lakes are already running dry. So these are dramatic challenges that we all face. One of the things that could be done to address some of this relates to food waste. 
30 to 40 percent of all food produced ends up wasted. In many developing countries, that occurs before it reaches the consumer. In countries like the United States and Western Europe, it often occurs post-consumer. Whether it happens early or late in the food chain, we need to address food waste, and that would make it much easier to address the demand for food as well. So what we really need is a more sustainable food production. And when I say sustainability, I think we often think in terms of environmental sustain sustainability. And that's, of course, critically important. We need to reduce the impact of agriculture on land, on water, on the climate. But sustainability really has three pillars, environmental, economic, and social and cultural. And if we don't have all three pillars, we won't have sustainable agriculture because environmentally friendly agriculture must also be economically viable. Farmers need to be able to make a living. It also needs to be socially and culturally appropriate. It doesn't help to have food if it's not the food that people want or expect. We may need to shift diets, but we need to work with people so that they appreciate the changes that need to be made instead of fighting uh, consumer behavior. Business as usual is simply not an option. We need to find technologies not only to address problems that disrupt the, our, our current food system. Now, some people like to say that our food system is broken, and they say that because 800 million people are going to bed hungry because of the impact of agriculture on the planet, but I don't really think our food system is broken because if things are broken, you should be able to look back into the past and find a time when they weren't broken. And I think in many ways, things are not bad and getting worse. They're good and getting better, just not fast enough. If we were farming today with 1960s technology, we would need an additional billion hectares of land in order to food, produce the food we have today. But because of innovation, because of new uh, technologies, because of changes in agricultural practices, we don't need that additional billion hectares, which is more than a quarter of all the forest on the planet. The problem is that consumers don't see forests that didn't get cut down. They only see the forests that do. And so we need to do a better job of explaining the benefits of innovation and technology so that consumers can be excited about it. I often say that consumers love innovation almost as much as they despise change. And there's no place that people despise change more than in the food they eat, because food is what brings us together with friends and family. And if you mess with my food, you're messing with my family and people don't like that. But if we don't change how we produce food, everything will change. We need to find new and better solutions. So today we're gonna to be talking about different types of uh, technology. On one hand, we have high-tech solutions that we'll hear a little bit about that include things like gene editing that are cutting edge, that are the uh, most advanced technologies. And those could be applied to pro uh, problems like tropical land race four, which is attacking the Cavendish banana, which is the most popular banana variety in the world. And it's at risk of, e that disease is at risk of it completely eliminating the most popular banana. It would go extinct, just as 50 years ago, the Gros Michel banana disappeared. And so we need these new technologies, and we'll hear a little bit more about that and how it might be applied. But we also have not high, just high tech, but sort of middle technologies, things that are much more uh, uh, have been applied in many different ways. And those might include things like blockchain and artificial intelligence. And we'll also hear more about how some of those technologies are being applied today, not just technologies for the future, but technologies that are very much robust and can be applied right away. And then finally, there's low tech, but I don't think it's really low tech, it's knowledge intensive agriculture. And that's about not just producing more food, but smarter and better ways. And we'll learn a little bit more about what's being done today to bring that knowledge intensive learning to farmers so that they can do a better job. It's not easy. Spreading knowledge can, is challenging, but hopefully we can take advantage of some of the new technologies to allow, allow knowledge transfer to occur at a faster pace.
In order to do these things, we need new policies that promote innovation and encourage collaboration. We need these things to be moving much more quickly than they are today. We need access to intellectual property, licensing, partnerships, and greater investment. And governments can, do, can promote access to these things, but they also require collaborations between the public and the private sector to succeed. Science tells us what we can do, but it's the public ultimately that tells us what we should do. So we also need to enhance consumer trust in our food system if we're going to be allowed to bring these innovations to market. We do this through greater transparency. And one way of being more transparent is by holding conferences like the one that you're participating in today so that we can share the latest information about what scientists are doing to create a more sustainable and nutritious future for all. And with that, they can understand why it's important and what's being done, and they can contribute to the conversation just as we hope that the listeners will do today. And so with that, I will conclude my remarks and hand it back to the moderator. Thank you once again for allowing me to participate in this important conversation. Thank you. I forgot to mute myself. Um, thank you again, Jack, for a very illuminating, um, you know, uh, and a very informative um, uh, topic that you have chosen to to um, have in this discussion session. Um, I particularly like the fact that you talked about high tech uh, on gene editing and 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 uh, and the 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 mid middle tech. Uh, on blockchain and as well as uh, about the knowledge intensive aspects of uh, agriculture. So I think with that, it looks very, it, it's ready for the next speaker, uh, Dr. Michael Gomez. Uh, he is a senior scientist at Alliance uh, of Bioversity International and SEAT at Kelly Columbia, uh, a leading plant genomic platform. Um, and he will be talking a lot on uh, gene editing. Uh, he'll be talking about his um, technology in, uh, uh, and I think I'll just pass it on to you because uh, he has received ex outstanding research publication uh, for the SEAT Award in 2017 for the phenomic research. Uh, he has the Vail Innovative and Intelligent Territory Award in 2019 for the category Digital Transformation in Agricultural Sector. Um, he also serves as a reviewer in several reputed international journals. So, with that kind of credentials, I'm pretty sure that your, your session will be very interesting. Please proceed. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. First of all, uh, thanks for the great opportunity. Uh, uh, as I told you, uh, we are working one of the CGIR Center Consultative Group on International Agriculture. Mainly our focus uh, uh, to support sustainable development goal. Next slide, please. Okay, so as I, um, uh, uh, Jack and Surya told, today I'm going to talk about some two technology. One is artificial intelligence, another one is genome editing. So I'm going to give some examples uh, that most favorite crop on banana. So uh, as you know, banana, uh, you know, is a very important crop. You know, we cannot complete our day without banana. So it's providing 400 plus million people rely on banana and also is a banana industry is so huge is 25 billion dollar industry but the banana facing a lot of challenges is one of the main challenge uh, as dr jack said about tr4 is kind of corona 2019 it came to colombia you know is a very devastating disease okay but the technologies matter Okay, it can be solvable. The technologies matter. Uh, second slide. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, banana is not only fusarium, that is TR4. Banana, uh, you know, attacked by different biotic and abiotic stresses. So you can see sometimes some virus affecting the entire plant, some fungus affecting the leaf, and also sometimes symptoms are internal. Uh, so is a 
very different crop you know you can see the symptom in all over the uh, plants right uh, next please this is one of the disease called banana blood disease is mainly the major disease in malaysia is attacked you can see the symptom in rashes the fruit bunch looks very good but the rashes is already started infection so we collected the huge amount of images from malaysia to uh, detect this particular disease bacterial disease next please Okay, so here I would like to talk about artificial intelligence. Right now, artificial intelligence is a major talk. It is uh, invading all the industry, but in agriculture, uh, but we are working on agriculture. Mainly we are applying to provide this is surveillance system and phenotyping to breed the crop. Next, please. Next slide. Yeah. Yeah. To provide the better work. Thank you. Okay, this is uh, the overall idea, you know, is not only detecting the disease, how to prevent, you know, to develop the early warning system to the entire world. This is the banana model. We are applying drone images, satellite images, publicly available satellite images and app. So we are applying artificial intelligence in each level. So satellite can detect the banana, where is banana? That's very important, right? Before detecting the disease, where, it, where it's banana, where is rice, where is beans? So we are applying the artificial intelligence to detect the banana and we are uh, doing the drone images to see the overall crop health and we are developing artificial intelligence app to detect the disease, the idea is to map the disease so that people will aware. Uh, of course, the disease will move in any direction. So the farmers and stakeholders and people should move. Where is the disease? That's the overall idea of the system. Next, please. Okay, so for this, we are collecting the huge data collection. As you know, as Dr. Surina said, you need a big, big data set uh, we are collecting the images banana images from africa india and malaysia these images from hotspot where the this is naturally occurring next please okay so so far we collected you know uh, that in the right now we have a 40000 annotation from nine classes and seven different models so uh, different this is like bacteria fungus, uh, some pest, for example, banana cum weevil, leaf diseases, and also we are collecting the healthy classes to differentiate the disease one and uh, the healthy one. Uh, you know, data is the new goal. You can see our paper. We have a huge amount of data set to develop the artificial intelligence app. Next, please. Okay, this is our deep planning pipeline. Uh, we collected huge amount of images. We labeled the data set uh, with renowned plant pathologists around the world. We confirm the disease and also we do the training uh, uh, to develop the models to detect the disease. Next, please. So this is our app, you know, after developing app, we put into the Android, simple Android phone for the public use the farmers and stakeholders it's free so they can use the app is very simple you have to take uh, images and scan your uh, the images where you are seeing the symptom and uh, receive the control so it will almost 90 percent accuracy of most of the diseases next please so this is the overview of the app so you can see one of the disease santomonas built is uh, accurately detected by our app Next, please. So this is another fusarium built, uh, Jack talked about. So this is from uh, Tamil Nadu, uh, India. Uh, so you can see more than 95% accuracy it's detecting the uh, fusarium. Next, please. So this is our app, it's free to everyone. So they can download, uh, use for the banana disease detection. Next, please. So this is our overall idea. So we have a cell phone, satellites, and phones uh, to build the uh, banana disease detection system globally. Next, please. Uh, you know, uh, as I mentioned to you, it's not only the detection. We are planning to use pest displays, already established platform, to map the disease globally. Next, please. 
So, and also we are doing capacity building to the farmers uh, in Africa and India, how to use the app. Next, please. So uh, next few slides, I'm going to talk about gene editing. Uh, as J Dr. Jack said, this is one of the frontiers in technology. CGIAR, we are investing on different crop. Of course, is Banana, is private company and other colleagues is doing. Uh, next, please. In our lab, uh, uh, CET, Cali Columbia Transformation Lab, we are doing the crops like cocoa for cadmium tolerance, cassava for waxy cassava, rice, male sterility, increasing grain number and waxy, and also hoga blaga resistant beans for digestibility. We have a huge pipeline. And also I have to say thanks to the Colum Colombian government. So allow us to test this kind of uh, uh, genome editing crop in a real field level. Next, please. So this is one of the genome editing uh, rice lines. We are testing currently in the open field testing in Colombia. Uh, uh, some of them are disease resistant. Some of them we are increasing the yield uh, for the virus, bacteria, and also some of them is a drought tolerance. Next, please. Next. Okay, so it's not only the creating the frontiers technology and also we have to preserve what we have, you know, uh, the global diversity food uh, crop diversity is huge. So it's not only creating the new technology, we have to store the seeds. That's why we are preserving crop diversity for the future seeds. So there is a more exciting things is happening to our uh, institute. We are building the new digital bank to store the seeds, it's going to hold 68,000 samples of common beans, cassava, and tropical forages. So I would say this is most important uh, for the future. Uh, so people can access the jam blossom, they can do the innovation, they bring in the new genes and alleles from this kind of diversity for the biotic and abiotic stresses. So you can crack a lot of climate change, uh, change genes from this house. Thank you. Next, please. This is the time to acknowledge our partners. So uh, for the Tumaini app, we are collaborating with the uh, Indian partners uh, to transmit the technology. Next, please. Uh, and also we are collaborating with NRCB Banana, ICAR to transmit the knowledge and transfer of Tumaini app to train the people and improve the model each and every day. Next, please. So this is our beautiful team. I'm not alone. The, this is the fantastic collaboration between agriculturists, computer engineers, microbiologists, and molecular biologists uh, to build a fantastic future. Next, please. Thank you uh, for the great opportunity. It's not only presenting my work. I'm learning from my colleagues and presenters. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. Uh, that was really interesting. I particularly like the, uh, the, the information that you have on your apps. I think that will be extremely useful. And I hope that the panel, uh, the, you know, the members of the audience will take that up and spread it around so that that app will be used. I think the mapping yeah. of your, uh, uh, the way, you know, the mapping of your diseases, the diseases uh, in, in, um, in plants are very important. So we go to the next speaker then. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Mr. Azizi Mionga. Uh, his involvement in plantation, agriculture, and food industry started in 1971 with Gath Guthrie PLC, where he spent 24 years as a planter and a strategic planner. Uh, he was the chairman of Pharma from 2001 to 2004 and the CEO of Malaysian Palm Oil Association, MPOA. Um, he, in 2006, he was appointed as board member of HDC till 2015 and spent seven years at SFFRC Sibanye understudying alternative crops to mitigate climate change. Extremely, extremely interesting. Azizi holds an MBA from Henley UK. Without further ado, I would like you to present your paper on blockchain for agriculture in the tropics. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, 
on the guest, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my topic is just straightforward, blockchain for agriculture in the tropics. But I think the purpose is to optimize the agriculture supply chain. When we talk about uh, agriculture uh, supply chain, we talk about farm to fork or seed to shelves. That's the uh, reflection of the supply chain. Next, please. Right, uh, I'm using a uh, blockchain as an example how to solve uh, three or four big issues in the country right now. And number one is the blockchain itself, uh, the supply chain itself, which is very uh, uh, op opaque, long, and uh, you know, uh, and, and crowded, uh, which is very in inefficient and, trans and and not transparent. And we have a big issue with food security, particularly uh, the import uh, bill, food import bill. And we have also a, a, a double whammy where the food loss and waste is equally uh, bad, uh, in spite of uh, importing uh, a lot of food at high cost. And also we have some secondary uh, governance issues in, in, in the supply chain. Next. All right, uh, if you look at the, uh, uh, the diagram, the first, the top diagram. Now, uh, this is the, 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 the supply chain of the multinational retailers. Uh, Products coming from overseas to the to the port from seaport, and then it goes to the uh, distribution center by a cold chain truck, and from cold chain truck it goes to the shelves within twenty four hours. Can you imagine the speed and the and and the and the cold chain uh, end to end? Yeah? Now compared to the traditional uh, supply chain, which is long, opaque, and uh, crowded, like I said just now, uh, everything works through this through the wholesale market, which is in control. Even though pharma, which is the government uh, institution, there has, has opened a direct access to farmers market and uh, even the supermarket for the farm, small, smaller farmers, but still the 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 wholesaler called a shot in terms of uh, supplying to the hotel, restaurant, and catering plus the, the, the wet market. See? So because they hold a big volume, they also hold a lot of data with something not accessible to the public. See? Next. Now, uh, I mentioned about the uh, uh, food import bill. If you, can you look from here, in, from 2013 to 2020, within eight years, the food bill jumped from 39 billion to about 55.5 uh, billion, uh, an increase of 39% within the eight years. So perhaps uh, it's not just food, feed and fiber. It, it, the high cost could be inflation, could be uh, currency, you know, uh, because the ringgit uh, or depreciated over, over some time. Next. Now, if you look at food waste, uh, I don't have to show, this is an article in one of the uh, newspapers, which I verified about 17,000 tons a day, we throw away good food, and uh, despite importing at high cost, and yet, you know, uh, we waste it a lot. Eh? So this is an issue which has not been addressed. And the bulk of the uh, waste, uh, 25 to 40% comes from the post harvest onward, meaning something to do with, with, with distribution, transportation, and the cold chain. And 30% at the retail and the consumer level. Perhaps uh, sometimes the it goes to the supermarket, uh, it passes the chef life, they just throw it away. Or uh, when the consumer uh, buys it, it doesn't consume, it just throw it away when the, when the product becomes uh, uh, biologically de deteriorated. Next, next, please. Now, uh, the other issues are fake uh, and, and, and uh, unsafe product. You know, the kind of damage is about 500 billion US a year you know, on fake products. Eh? And a broken cold chain, like I mentioned just now, uh, causing the uh, high food loss and waste. And consumer, this is what mentioned by Bob, uh, Dr. Jack just now, that uh, there is no uh, communication between the producer and the consumer because of the broken supply chain. And most of the uh, uh, stakeholders, they, they work in silos, you know. And cybersecurity, you know, with the increase in online uh, uh, sale, e-commerce, there's a lot of issue about uh, cybersecurity. Next. Now, we can overcome the four big issues just by looking at traceability, which is a law you know, in, in terms of safety. Uh, whatever standard, whether you have my gap, global gap, RSPO, you still need to uh, go for traceability because it's a law under EU. 178 2000 and including food safety new uh, regulation in, in, in US uh, 2011, the emphasis is on traceability. But blockchain works very beautifully with, uh, with, uh, food, uh, with, with traceability and hence we can reset the whole uh, supply chain, make it shorter, smarter, 
visible and, and more efficient. And food security and uh, food uh, loss and waste, we can put them together under, under the national food balance sheet, which is something uh, quite laborious, not many people paying attention to it, but this is a very important document. But with the help of new digital tools like big data, AI, analytics, this uh, uh, food balance sheet should be brought up again in order to control the import and the food loss and waste. And of course, the, the, the digital uh, uh, governance that I mentioned earlier, uh, with, with the help of blockchain, you can overcome food fraud and provenance issue and so on and so forth. Next, please. Right, uh, simple uh, understanding about blockchain. The, the existing uh, IT system, we use a central, uh, central centralized data to keep all our database, our own information. But this is a single point failure because you can amend, you can go in uh, the, the system and change information. See? But when you move migrate to blockchain, which is a decentralized database and, uh, and is distributed uh, to nodes, which is run over the uh, peer-to-peer uh, -peer network, you can't change anything. If you change anything, you have to change everything. So that makes uh, less temptation uh, for, for whoever participant wants to change information. You can't change at all. And at the same time, uh, you can bypass the central authority like banks and even law firm uh, if you're using this peer-to-peer -peer system. Now, there are other additional features in the blockchain like consensus mechanism that you can come in into the, uh, into the blockchain, uh, open public blockchain, which is permissionless. But then again, you know, you, 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 you need to spend a lot of time to do uh, proof of work and it's quite costly. Or you go into a permission one where you, if you own a, if you're a master node owner, you may have a lot of influence on the, uh, on the distribution of, of information, see, including the uh, miners that work un under you. See. Now, smart contract is another uh, new tool, which is self-executing uh, uh, software. Now, this is good because anything which is non-compliant in terms of quality, safety, you can put the condition into the smart contract and it doesn't matter, the contract doesn't work. See. So there is a, a one way to, 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 to check on the, any form of uh, violation. Next. Now, this is the, 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 the full-blown uh, uh, sub, uh, supply chain using a, a blockchain. You can see these are all blockchain. And in between, the blockchain are kept at a critical control point, but they also have uh, issue. They also come up with data, which is kept in a QR code, which is connected, and it will link eventually to the product labeling and so on and so forth. So if you can flash your handphone on the QR code, you can see the product origin, the date, where it come from, and provenance, and so on and so forth. So this is quite uh, interesting. And, but the problem is, between uh, the farmer to the consumer, there is an area here, upstream in particular, where most of the documents are still paper-based, and connectivity uh, is, is, is also uh, a big issue here. And of course, now there are apps, uh, example like what they showed by the previous speaker, uh, distributed apps, like uh, using handphone to collect data, or image processing, you can take picture and send over. So that, that that sort of thing is quite useful in terms of data collection. And only when you digitize the whole thing here, you can go into digitalization, which you can use the cloud computing, AI, you can use big data, and you can use, uh, uh, what do you call that? Uh, machine learning as well. Yeah? So you can only do that provided this is covered. And also earlier, there was an area here where there's not much information. Now with the handphone, uh, with QR code, we have this, this uh, information available. Next. <clears throat> okay, the, the, the important point here is the supply chain, the physical supply chain is still linear, but the communication chain, uh, it's uh, circular now, meaning you can connect with the freedom to, to, to connect one to one or one to many. This will be the game changer in terms of uh, making the uh, supply chain more transparent. Next. Next, please. Okay, if you look at this, uh, blockchain doesn't handle uh, only uh, business transaction, but he also carry information on uh, on, on ESG, on 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 uh, uh, compliance. Uh, because, for example, at, in all time we have NDPE, you need to show whether evidence or no deforestation, no feed, and so on and so forth. And you have a, a, a command center here, and you have the uh, center where. We have also the sensors that you can monitor irrigation, outdoor, indoor farming, vertical or urban farming. You can even, uh, you know, uh, supervise uh, open farming here. 
disease uh, infection you can monitor plus even the, the, the size of the fruit uh, that, that you can uh, that you, you you can monitor the, the growth eh? oh. that is my next please yeah that is my last slide the, the, the only thing in conclusion i just want to emphasize the importance of traceability because uh, it is important to look into your uh, human right and environmental stewardship uh, including transfers in supply chain and then data warehousing where you keep all the information off chain or on chain to do all your analysis on the food balance sheet and the important thing the involvement of the young uh, youngsters into farming and i've seen some uh, crowdfunding going on for 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 uh, precision farming thank you very much Thank you, uh, Azizi. That's uh, very interesting, especially your last slide, which covers uh, the conclusion of what, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, farming, traceability and supply chain traceability becomes very important. And not only to the consumers, but also to regulators to, yeah. to detect any uh, violation or any breaches of what you are producing or are in during the supply chain. And I particularly like the fact that you have the information about the blockchain technology to enable us to have a more circular way of addressing uh, the, the, you know, the production of food. So um, this goes very nicely to the last speaker, uh, Mr. Chandra Sekhar, and uh, on his proposed title of how smallholders can adapt to frontier technology. Uh, uh, Mr. Chandra Sekhar has is the founder president of Saguna Rural Foundation. He has a Master's of Science in Food Tech at the University of California, Davis, a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture in Kokan Krishi Vidyapati Dapoli. I, I hope I, I pronounced that prop, uh, properly. He's a successful farmer, very happily working since 1976. And his dream was that farmers should get dignity, which gives birth to concept Krishi Prayatan or agro tourism. So I think I will pass on the next, uh, I will pass on this to Mr. S uh, Chandrasekhar to present his uh, uh, happy and confident farmers by no-till SRT farming technology. Please. Thank Sekhar. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And our team believes that happy and confident farmer has not been a top priority of research and development of various institutions. Farmers need immediate results, while scientists and governments need data, which take long time. Me and my team were attracted by action resulting the happy farmers. Hence, we blindly invested our efforts into action during the past decade. This has now resulted in a slow and steady farmers movement for adoption of the no-till method, that is SRT. And uh, uh, next, please. Next. So we define SRT as it is a conservation agriculture, zero-till method of farming, which does not cause atrocity of tillage, completely stops soil erosion, promotes natural production of earthworms is organic carbon of the soil considerably increases productivity of the land and added effect of amazing happiness and confidence to the farmer next so this technique is not only making the farmers happy but it is also addressing those 17 sdgs 17 sustainable development goals seven of those seven sdgs are addressed or affected by our srt method next the most important is the technology should be affordable affordable to the smallest of the small farmers world is facing big challenge through these smallholder farmers majority of the farmers at least in india 84% of the farmers are smallholder farmers. Their land is less than one hectare. So to those small farmers, the technology is working, especially to SDG number one, that is no poverty. 
and a two that is zero hunger. Very important. This particular farmer, his only possession for this technology is the knapsack sprayer which is carrying on his back and the small tool which is held by his two daughters that is SRT frame. All this is, is uh, the price of all this possession is less than $65. So this is an affordable technology next. So next picture is addressing the SDG goal number three that is good health and well-being. Good health to human being can come from healthy food and healthy food cannot come without healthy soil. SRT is improving, increasing organic carbon of the soil each year by, by adding half a percent organic carbon to the soil while they take the crop. So when the organic carbon of the soil is maintained to more than 1%, the food that will be produced is healthier. And if it is healthy food, the health can also be good of the people consuming, which is, uh, which is, the, which is the farmers. And also the productivity of those plots by SRT method is either doubling or tripling. So it is automatically bringing well-being to the farmers. So healthy food and well-being to the well-being to the farmers is also addressed. Next, let's go to the next slide. So this is how it is also addressing very important gender equality. SRT is making like rice farmers, there are several operations that farmer has to conduct by traditional method. But SRT has reduced those number of operations. It has reduced, not only reduced the number of operations, but the operations have become easy. There's, they have become so easy that just the women farmers from the family, they can easily take care of their, of their land and they can produce food for the family without being intervention, without being must presentation of men so they can they are very happy they are very independent and so they have become confident also woman farmer becoming happy and confident is one of the greatest achievement of srt and we have collected good important data also on this next slide please next so in this particular situation this the the clean water and sanitation is the is a is a goal of uh, sdg you can see on the left hand side, uh, uh, on the left hand side here, this uh, beautiful silt from the paddy field is getting washed away. This is because of the traditional method involves plowing and puddling. Plowing and puddling lets the beautiful silt go away out of the plot, which is close to 20% we have measured it. Whereas SRT doesn't involve any tillage, and that is why clean water goes out of the field. If the clean water goes out of the field into the water bodies, in the streams, in the lakes, then it's automatically good water and, and good sanitation. Not only uh, that this surface water that is going getting out, excess water is cleaner, but because of increased carbon, water infiltration has improved and water infiltration, uh, in, improved water infiltration automatically cleans the water. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, the next, next slide is happy farmers uh, in case of rice cultivation because it is the decent work and economic growth. You can see these are the farmers from six agroclimatic zones of Maharashtra. Their cost of production is reduced, their drudgery is reduced, and on top of it, the productivity has increased double, triple, and, and uh, the, the everything is because of which they have become happy and uh, happy farmers in case of rice is a very unusual phenomena and their economic growth also is confirmed. Next slide, please. Next. Next. So here in the next slide, what uh, you can see is the climate smart and resilient agriculture. Uh, you can see in the in, uh, in, in, uh, in this particular set of slides. This upper slide is traditional paddy field and side by side, this is SRT farmer. Because of excess rain, it's not only the crop is washed away, it's not only the crop that is washed away, but even the soil is washed away. Whereas in the case of SRT, 
it's his crop is also not washed away and soil is not gone on the contrary the the crop is better he is going to get at least average or even better crop better yield so this is very important the srt is a climate smart agriculture and so what results to into the next slide this is what it results the soil in case of our farm after three years the soil has become fragrant it has become smoother and it has become softer that's because our organic carbon has risen from 0.3 percent to 1.5 percent in three years so this is something fantastic this is climate smart this is this is the kind of climate action that is expected from all over the world and especially from the rice field so what we need to do next slide please what do we need to do we need to change our path we need to go by a different way as albert einstein said we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking that created them in the first place so we cannot go on the same path which is so what is that next what is that path next slide please so what is that path this is the next slide so what is that path it is degenerative method of agriculture we need to go from degenerative method of agriculture to regenerative method of agriculture in case of degenerative method of agriculture we are insisting on bigger machines bigger plowing more uh, pulverization of the soil whereas we say we don't need to do any plowing any tillage now this is a land which is which is not been tilled for five years and this farmer is taking wheat after rice without plowing and he has been benefited so next slide so what is happening so this is our procedure our procedure uh, of this is the steps or uh, protocol we make our beds with the tractor we use tractor but only once after 20 20 years later we don't have to use any machine any tractor so this tractor after plowing and making the beds we can make the beds either with the track oops my time is over no oh. you... <laughs> okay you oh, to... i just saw zero zero yeah. <laughs> all right so uh, the tractor is used for making uh, beds raised beds that are permanent raised beds then the the farmer needs this one tool we call it srt bed the cost of the tool is less than 25 dollars and uh, this is the dibbling operations of course and the, after dibbling then we do only one operation that is uh, selective pre-emergence weed site that is uh, spraying of selective weed pre-emergence and then gap filling and uh, placing of the urea bracket and we give apply fertilizer only once and this is the beautiful crop that you get which is uniformly vigorous of course here this operation is still too manual and, and the harvesting these are the two operations we are working on very uh, very frantically to solve these operations by by mechanization we want we want uh, help from all over the world whosoever has the technology to do the impact dibbler uh, is something that we are looking for and we need a combined paddy harvester and thresher where uh, it will not ruin the uh, texture of the soil so these are the these are the operations next slide please what we get next slide so what we get is presence of earthworms no come back come back this is something important that we are able to show presence of earthworms in all different types of soil in all different types of agroclimatic climate uh, 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 lands and it is not only for uh, it is not only for rice but it is for 25 different crops in uh, in, starting from rice to cotton to soybean and maize next slide next slide so this is this is one of my this is the last slide where we show that improvement of the uh, texture and structure of the soil is possible with no-till agriculture thank you very much thank you Sheka. that was very very interesting very practical in the approach the srt till no-till technology i think is something that would uh, really improve um, interest a lot of smallholders, uh, small farmers, because I'm pretty sure that it doesn't require a lot of investment. Um, I hope that you know that some of the audience who are particularly uh, you know um, uh, 
uh, in touch with smallholders would pass on this knowledge that you have shared with us. So thank you very much. So we come to the end of the uh, panel presentation. Very, very interesting, uh, uh, very uh, knowledgeable, um, uh, uh, you know, presentation. I really enjoy it. Uh, I think uh, we have some questions uh, that has been posed by our, um, uh, you know, members. Um, I think uh, one of them is about the mobile app. So I knew that your mobile app is going to be very, very, uh, you know, popular, uh, Michael. So this, uh, the question is: having mobile app to detect plant disease is cool. Do you know if there are other apps than Tum Tumiani in the tropics? And whether too many de detects diseases in other plants too. So, uh, over to you, Michael. Yeah, you know, uh, too many right now focusing only on banana right now. So, but we are uh, working on other crops, and also you know the other uh, CGIR product called Nuru is a uh, other uh, app uh, for cassava and uh, potato and uh, fall uh, fall army worm. So. Uh, you know, in, in terms of Tumaini, right now we are focusing only on banana because banana have a several disease. So we are focusing only on banana right now, but our future, the, of course, we want to extend to other crops like beans, rice, etc. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Okay, perhaps you can share that other apps as well, uh, you know, yeah, sure. with, uh, you know, with us so that maybe we can pass on to, to the questions. Okay. So, um, you know, I was just looking through, uh, you know, hearing the presentations. I think the, the message that comes out a lot is about food waste. I think, uh, this is, uh, you know, this was mentioned, uh, by Jack. It was mentioned by, uh, Azizi. Um, and, you know, so I think food waste is something that we need to look at it. Um, so in terms of. You know, um, building public support to address food waste. What kind of policies do we do you think we need to put in place in order for governments uh, to you know to to uh, encourage uh, such kind, such behavior? Because this is something that is also been mentioned that uh, you know. Um, we need to make sure that you know consumers also have learned behavior. So maybe Jack, you can start with this if you don't mind. And I think food waste uh, is not one problem; it's a thousand problems, and it depends on the crop, it depends on the country, it depends on the level of technological advancement. So you know, starting on the farm, uh, it could mean having on-farm storage. Uh, it could mean having a cold chain between the farmer and the uh, place where it's going. It could mean having infrastructure that allows food to travel, um, you know, without bumpy roads and other things. Uh, and it could be policies in the store. So, for example, in France, they've passed some very strong uh, requirements that require uh, grocery stores to find ways of you know, getting rid of the food that doesn't mean throwing it in the trash. So they have to partner with hunger assistance programs and others to make that food available. Uh, in China, there've been rules that are limiting uh, buffets and other things where food is wasted. Uh, policies that make it easier for organizations to give away the food. So at the end of a conference, so there's no liability, they don't feel like they're at risk. And so there are different policies that affect different aspects of it. Um, labels on the food, you know, many consumers think that a best buy date is really about safety when it's often about quality. And so if people see that the food has expired, they may throw it away. It may be perfectly healthy. It's just not as good as it may be. It's stale. So understanding what those labels mean is important. And of course, much food is wasted um, after it reaches the consumer. And that's a lot about information, helping consumers to understand how to maintain and take care of food uh, in order to you know, limit the, the food waste that occurs at the home. So sorry for the long answer. That's, that's excellent. So I, you know, I, I think this goes towards what uh, uh, Azizi, you were talking about the use of blockchain 
to help control food waste. Um, so what kind of infrastructure do you think it's required in order for us to introduce blockchain technology to control food waste, not only at the consumer level, but also uh, at, you know, um, you know, uh, in, 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 in supermarkets and grocery stores, which have like, you know, uh, end date for, for food. I mean, what kind of infrastructure is required? Is it a lot of, uh, investment that's required, uh, a lot of capacity building, maybe uh, GSEC, you can answer that question. Um, I think you are on mute. Still on mute. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairman, because uh, I agree with Jack uh, on the policy you mentioned in France and China, uh, but I think there is another thing that we can work with the supermarket because supermarket tend to standardize the size and shape of the product as a result, a lot of farmers cannot get their, their product to the supermarket, even though the product is good, healthy, but because it's not in the right shape and design, so it's not accepted. So that's one waste from the farm that can be avoided. You can grade it A, B, C, whatever, but it, it should be taken up in, in the market. That's one thing. Second thing, I think food logistics, the key in the tropic, you know, because you have really hot weather, cold chain is, is, is a necessity. You know. And and um, I was uh, involved in building one of the coaching companies uh, in, in Malaysia, yeah, Coaching Network. That was started by me. Uh, it's under Kazana. Uh, now, uh, between uh, the coaching system that I built against what is in the market, my waste is only 5%. 5% compared to 25 to 40%, especially on greens, perishable. Yeah? Okay, we're not talking about meat, or but, but your fish and meat, if it's the wrong temperature, you're going to have problems. It's all about temperature control they have to make it into a policy or even even uh, support the the, the logistic uh, players no? uh, rather than put policy uh, you can facilitate them to move into cold chain you will save a lot of money you know? uh, and then uh, and the technology are there i mean uh, cold chain technology is there all the time okay no. uh interesting but i just wonder why no and, one has taken up uh, then if the technology is there and uh the because, uh, you know so I'm, I'm trying to understand policy is clear. So why is there no uptake in, in it? Sure. Mm. Because the, 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 the one who controls the uh, supply chain are the wholesalers. I, I'm, I'm not going to like to say the word cartel, but uh, I was with pharma chairman. We've been trying to uh, emulate what they do, improve on it, but it's not difficult. It's not that easy because they control the distribution from the supermarket, wet market, uh, you name it, like, all the market, uh, is, uh, you know, the horeca, hotel, restaurant, and catering, all under them. So it is not easy to 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 break until you incentivize these people and until the government have a dialogue with these people and they have to put in some capital uh, for the people to go into cold chain. Eh? Because the, the problem to, to the wholesaler, they're not. It's not important to them. The farmers are suffering, not them. You know, because they're going to pay the farmers whatever net of uh, the losses. Eh? So the farmers is the victim, you know. So I, I don't know how to put policy because if we tried, we did put on labeling, on uh, you know, on on packaging, you know, on that. But uh, that's not uh, good enough. So I think this is a uh, issue which I think uh, I hope the Ministry of uh, Agriculture uh, people are you know are, are, are around to hear. And of course, at, at the consumer end, it's a bit difficult. You need a lot of education. You know, example like you buy a lot, you don't you don't cook, you know, you throw it away, you know. So this is something that the only, only the individual uh, to to some education or awareness uh, that, that that we can uh, overcome. Otherwise, it's very difficult. Uh, like, like what Jay say lah, Jack say, it come from many many problem many sources. The problem uh, in food loss and waste. Yeah? yeah. So I guess we have to take it one 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 uh, problem at a time. There's another question on regenerative agriculture. There was a question of what is regenerative agriculture. Is it the same as organic farming? But tilt, tilting would increase the soil productivity, isn't it? So I think this is directed to Sheka. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, regenerative agriculture is not organic farming. Regenerative agriculture is where while the farmer is producing food in his farm, normally our uh, science, present science, the traditional or conventional science says that the soils are exhausted. 
the nutrients from the soil are sucked by the crop and it goes out. But regenerative method of agriculture says that it doesn't have to go out. It can be sequestered and making the soil healthy. So while the while the plant is growing, it, it goes through photosynthesis, resynthesis, exudation, and humification. So it fixes the carbon each time you grow the crop. And in this situation, the psychology philosophy is the grain or food is for human being, the middle portion for animal, and the roots for the motherly soil. If you leave the roots in the soil, the soil becomes healthy. It is regenerative. So it regenerates. And this is what is regenerative agriculture. Okay. Um, I think there's a follow-up to that question. It says that although no-till is a good practice in terms of maintaining soil diversity and prevention of nutrient loss through erosion, the biggest challenge is to control weed. Is there a way to control weed by adopting organic no-till farming? Oh, well, um, one of the scientists in, um, in America, uh, I was talking to him about organic farming. So he said, organic farming is not a method of agronomy or cultivation. It is a method of marketing. <laughs> and as a farmer, I'm not interested in marketing until I get the food at comfortable price. So appropriate use of chemicals and in our method of SRT, that is regenerative no-till method of farming, our, there are three principles. One is no tillage, no plowing. Second is control of weeds by weedicides, appropriate weedicides that are found out, confirmed by science and technology that they are safe to use. Third is a rotation of the crops. Don't take rice after rice. Take something else after rice. And, and third crop is something different. So rotation is another principle. So use of weedicides can turn off the tractor and control the weed. And we have found out that such a practice invites the natural presence of earthworms. There is immense growth of microorganisms. So the soil becomes soft and fragrant. So it is safe. It is confirmed that it is not harmful for the soil or for the environment to use the herbicides. Excellent. Okay, so I I wanted to uh, move away from uh, this and uh, and follow up on genome editing because I think that was really interesting. Um, I think there's a lot of um, uh, you know fear about what genome editing could lead to, you know, and so I think the the question that I want to put forward is that uh, the regulations in uh, involving genome editing. Uh, you know, are there enough regulations to ensure that there is no abuse when it comes to genome editing, as well as in terms of testing the crops when, you know, you have genome editing uh, on the crops that you have uh, edited, I mean, um, um, edited in terms of the, the, the genomes. So maybe, uh, Michael, you can help us yeah. uh, understand yeah. this. Yeah, definitely. So the Regulation is the big chapter right now. The entire world is talking about the regulation, especially on transgenics and uh, genome editing. So in uh, Colombia, in Seattle, we have uh, experience on testing, right? For example, the two part, first you, you can create genome editing for fusarium or something in any part of the world, but you have to test in the hot spot to see is there any, you know, uh, benefit of genome editing that's what i am doing i'm testing so i'm we are receiving a lot of lines from all over the world so we are testing uh, colombia uh, example uh, grain yield uh, some viruses some bacteria resistant so for that uh, we are convincing uh, the colombian government uh, to test the crop that's one side so another one is uh, releasing as a genome editing variety. One of the example is Japan, GABA in uh, tomato, you know, gamma amino butyric acid now uh, they're uh, released in uh, in the field level. So it's in the market. 
So uh, this is based on the country regulation, you know, people acceptance, right? Is a huge uh, thing is going on. Right now it's changing, you know, a lot of countries are deregulating. They, they are allowing the people to test uh, genome editing. But for me, I would say uh, is is based on the ac acceptance uh, of the people right now. Uh, so the frontiers technology, of course, genome editing is a boom to the breeding. You know, innovative breeding is one of the innovative breeding. Of course, is based on the people acceptance. So uh, as far as in CF, we are mainly working on testing the crop, testing how the genome editing technology uh, beneficial you know compared to conventional so we are doing a lot of proof of concept studies uh, of course we have a legal permission to test rice cassava beans uh, we are testing in the field level to see the potential but of course we need a lot of regulation behind this genome editing thank you okay um i think uh, the question being is that with all this genome editing is this going to be acceptable in con in uh like for example, in the EU, because I've been understand, I, you know, I'm a, I understand that this is more like a almost a genetic modification. Um, so, what would be what would be the, the the stance of EU in this case? I mean, would they be able to accept the you know uh, the fruits of your labor? Maybe uh, I think this one. I think I will pass on to Jack on this because this is about policy. Yes. Yes. Sure. So I think right now uh, the European Union is still trying to figure out what its final policy is going to be on gene edited products, uh, both plants and animals. Uh, there have been large uh, support among the scientific community that the products not be regulated like genetic engineering. And uh, the example was already given of Japan. Uh, Japan has been a country that has traditionally not been very accepting of genetic engineering and yet they have been they're now a leader in terms of gene editing they both have the plant crop that was mentioned the tomato as well as a fish product that was recently approved and both of those were approved with no regulate regulatory oversight and yes. the reason is because they are um, changes that could have occurred naturally and it's just turning off a gene or turning off on a gene and that's the that's what's important is that the changes that are made um, are things that could have occurred naturally. Now they still need to report that to the government, and it goes on a registry, and that ensures that it won't end up in trade to countries that limit uh, those products. But it's very interesting. The tomatoes are being sold as seeds directly to consumers, and people can plant them themselves. They can grow these tomatoes. And it has a consumer benefit. It's in, expected to lower blood pressure. And so, you know, there's a real consumer benefit to that. And I think it makes it much more tangible that consumers, if you want something, then concerns generally disappear. But often when we talk about uh, gene editing or genetic engineering, we're thinking of farmer traits. And those are agronomic traits, which most consumers don't understand because they don't know that there's a direct benefit to them. And so I think it's great that these new products are coming with those benefits that consumers will understand. Yes. Well, okay. So Michael, you have something that you want to add to that? Uh, you know, I just a compliment Dr. Jack. Of course, the mutation is happening in natural, you know, uh, that's what he's saying. The mutation is not a new thing. So in the, the evolution, mutation is happening throughout our evolution. So just, uh, you know, ba based on our beneficial traits, so we are creating the mutation artificially. So that's what I would like to compliment. Thank you. Okay, great. Can, can, can I ask a question? Can I ask yes. Jack a question? Sure. Uh, yes, Please. Jack, uh, about, what about appellation, you know? How does that hold in terms of traceability, in terms of law? You know? Because let's say the product comes from a certain district, you know, example, like, of course, uh, Bordeaux, you're know, talking about wine. Uh, in, in Sarawak, there's a special fish, Amprao, only can come from there. Of course, people are taking it out and then trying to multiply, and, but the original is there. And if you put an appellation, for example, to prevent uh, you know, people from taking away, so how does the law stand on, on this issue? I think it's going to depend on the product, um, whether or not, so the, the tomato that I mentioned, if you sell it directly to the consumer, 
the consumer is going to plant it, then they're going to save those seeds. And so I assume that the license allows you to continue to, to use it. Uh, for other products, they're going to have a license that doesn't allow the end user to then, you know, reuse that trait. Uh, but these products are coming as, as have a benefit and therefore it should be labeled and communicated to consumer because hopefully it's a superior product and that information will, will be available. Um, but you're right with some products, you know, that's going to be an issue uh, in the future, how they're labeled and how it's communicated and what the licensing is. So that's really interesting because I, I know that, you know, uh, Sarawak uh, peppers and, uh, you know, you have basmati rice, Bordeaux wines. They are very specific region, regional specific, but that comes under licensing. You know, this li licensing of a specific uh, region for a specific product and uh, that I don't think you can, uh, I mean, if you were to try and uh, take it and claim it as yours, that's going to violate some intellectual property. Um, I think this comes up to the questions of uh, intellectual property and how, uh, you know, the masses can, can, uh, can benefit from, in, you know, from some of the technology that, you know, all of you right now are sharing quite openly. And I think that's a benefit that we all need to go towards, which is to share our technology rather than, you know, hoard, you know, hoarding it and saying that, well, this is mine and, you know, you have to pay license. So right. I, I think this is a question that I will ask all of you. Okay, well, go ahead, Jack. Yeah, I, yeah, I was going to say, I mean, I, I think that, you know, geographical indications, trademarks are important. And so if somebody, um, edits a product that the trademark, the owner of that mark still has a right to compensation or, you know, to be engaged in that decision. They may deny the, um, the technology developer, the ability to use that product. And so, uh, just because you're doing something new doesn't extinguish the rights of the original patent owner, licensing owner, trademark owner, those things still exist. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, uh, as you know, patents, for example, last only about 20 years uh, from the time that it has been approved. But um, in terms of licensing, uh, in terms of, as you say, regional, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, rights, that, of course, stays with the, with the region or, or the, you know, the, the area. Um, what I'm trying to say is that I'm talking about more about technology. I mean, you look at AstraZeneca, for example, you know, it is, it's, it's free while Pfizer's uh, COVID uh, uh, vaccine is not. So going towards this, when you look at frontier technology, you know, each of you have technology that you wanted to share. And uh, so, for example, the app that you have and the SRT till no till technology. So. I think what I'm I'm going to ask now is that from from each of you maybe like uh, you know a couple of minutes about your take on the you know how we can go about having the technology, sharing that prosperity, and encouraging that kind of behavior. Of course, uh, you know I understand that we are looking at uh, um, you know. Uh, capitalism, but we are now looking at a, more, a broader picture. So maybe I will start with uh, the last speaker, uh, Shekhar. Um, can you please give me your yes. take on this? Yeah. A couple minutes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, our technology is already been selected by FAO for their TECA. TECA is technologies and practices for smallholder agri practitioners. They have accepted it and we have licensed them free of cost to use it all over the world. That's one. But it is our observation that a needy farmer, if he can listen or looks at our website or looks at our YouTube films, he can learn just by looking at YouTube uh, channel. And there are thousands of farmers in Maharashtra, in my state, who have adopted this technique, and now it has become a movement. A successful farmer is teaching another success, another needy farmer. 
and the movement is rolling it's it is catching speed without anybody's help so we are already open for it please take it to your country thank you okay thank you uh so i go to the next one um Azizi, what do you think? I mean, how do we ensure that technology is not hoarded, that it is shared? Uh, although, of course, I agree that we do need to reward the, the, the technology provider, but how do we ensure that it is not excessive? How do we ensure collaboration? So is it blockchain technology? Is it, I mean, how do, how do you go about doing this? I think, uh, uh, personally, I think th there is, uh different between innovation and invention, you know, because a lot of things that we innovate, the technology is already in the public domain, you know, we put them, we bundle them together, for example, a blockchain, it comes from uh, the P2P, then you have this uh, uh, hash function, it, it is there, you know, so they bundle it together and call it a blockchain, you know, so that cannot necessarily be uh, uh, IP, you know, it, it has to be, uh, uh, because you're taking the technology in the public domain and put them together, it's more of innovation. So uh, invention is totally something like what Elon Musk is doing. That is completely out of the you know uh, normal. That could be an invention that you can patent, you know. But innovation, I'm not too sure, Jack. Uh, innovation, can you patent innovation? I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? Uh, no, uh, yeah. Can you help me in this innovation? Can you patent it? Whatever you innovated, you know, a product or you know, a system, and uh, try to make claims, you know. Um, yeah, I think it's pieces of it you can in terms of blockchain, uh, but you know I don't know that you can uh, patent the entire system. But you know, like the AI aspects of it, uh, you know, would certainly be patentable, or uh, the application to a particular problem or challenge might be the app that you create that implements the the blockchain. You know, so there, you're you're going to be able to create some IP protection for some parts of it, but the concept is not patentable. But the incarnation of that product, um, you know, could be patentable. Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so the the conclusion is that we don't patent it, or I mean, what my question is that we want to make sure that uh, technology can benefit, right. you know. The masses, yeah. rather so than I'm, the few. Yeah, I, I would say that there, there's certainly a role for intellectual property. And so basic research, though, it's good if that's foundational and that that information, and that's why it's good to happen at universities through government research and, and other things. But in order to bring products to market, somebody has to be able to make money. And so yeah. you know, just... The initial um, idea for CRISPR, you know, was an idea that somebody had, but it wasn't created into a final product. And so, uh, if somebody's going to to go to that trouble, then they know that they they have some way of protecting that final product. And so, I think that you know there is a role, uh, but it depends on the application. So, for example, with golden rice, one of the lessons that was learned was that when it was the original um, patents did not allow for you to give away the technology. And so Erie and others had to go back and renegotiate all of the licenses with the companies that own the different patents. And now, whenever a patents are issued, they often include a, a clause that says, it's okay to make this freely available to a nonprofit for, uh, you know, for food security reasons. And so they've changed the rules in order to make it easier to facilitate um, so you can make money by selling it to a company, but you can give it away to the CGIR. And, and so I think we, we need that balance. Uh, some products need regulatory approval. And if it's going to cost $10 million to bring it to market, you better own what you produce. Um, otherwise, you know, you're, nobody's ever going to do it. And so I think we just need to recognize that um, intellectual property serves some role, but it should never be an obstacle to innovation. It should be in sort of to further uh, or promote innovation. Yeah. Well, thank you. So, Michael, what do you think? Because, you know, you, you are working with uh, very uh, interesting high tech uh, frontier technology. 
Um, what would be your take on this? I mean, I mean, I, I know that you're working in, uh, in, in an area and you're sharing the technology, but this balance that Jack was yeah. uh, mentioning, how would you uh, articulate this, this uh, idea forward? Um, you know, uh, I am listening to Jack. Uh, you know, the thing is here, uh, you know, the research is always money. You know, you need money to continue the research. Of course, our app, we never patent. So it's free, you know, uh, CGIAR is free to the, uh, anyone is free. You can download, we never charge on this. But other side, as a principal investigator, I have to improve the app, right? We need money. So most of our product, uh, from bilateral funding from different donor like the Magadir Foundation, there's a different foundation. But end of the day, we have to improve the app or product what we release so that we need some return to us. That's what we are looking for public private partnership. You know, public private partnership, you have a lot of advantage like access to finance, access to knowledge, transfer of risk, investment opportunities, and business development. We don't want any money from the farmers, but we need some money to run the research. That's why uh, we are collaborating with partners. Mo most of our app is making a decision. Okay, this is the this is this is you have to control. But the input uh, to control the thing is coming from the private company, right? So this is the biocontrol agent you are to spray. This is the chemical you are to spray. This is the method. So what we are uh, se several uh, companies we, they want to collaborate with us, right? Michael, so, okay, your app is free. So your app is fantastic, but we will put your app into our cell phone. We are giving the input to the farmers. So we will give some return to your research project so you can continuously improve because new diseases always coming, new technology is coming. So we have to always update. So it's my challenge is how to run this project with the, you know, uh, with funding, you know? For me, the best solution is public-private partnership. Of course, we need a transparency, trust, and policy to unite public and private partnership to bring the uh, you know benefit to the smallholder farms. Thank you. Very nice. So, okay, so we are going towards the end of our session. It has been really interesting. So, I think. What I'll do is I'll go and allow you guys to give one minute, please, because I have four minutes. Please, Jay, go ahead. Yeah, I, I would just say, you know, I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I think it's a very important conversation. Innovation, you know, can in many ways save the planet. The next 30 years are the most important 30 years there will ever be. And after that, population growth will slow. So every day between now and 2050, it gets harder to feed the world. Every day after 2050, it will get easier. And so we need to do all we can today to ensure that the technologies, innovations that are being developed at the research institutes actually make it to the farmers and ultimately to the consumers uh, because it's a very important time in human history. So uh, thank you for allowing me to participate in this discussion. Thank you. Michael, your turn. Uh, you know, I uh, first of all, thank you for the foundation. It's a great opportunity for me to interact with everyone here. So for me, the uh, message or, you know, thing is, okay, we are developing all frontiers in technology. That would be fantastic for the future. There is no doubt on it, but we have to preserve what we have. You know, that's very, very important. We have a treasure variety of uh, plants, variety of seeds. That's what, you know, it's not only creating the technology to preserve the things for the future. That is called future seeds. You know, we have to preserve the diversity. That is our treasure for future agriculture. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. Azizi, please. Well, I am um, uh, very sad in the sense that um, not much has been done now uh, in agriculture in this country because uh, there's a lot of focus on other crops. Uh, the thing is, um, the, uh, the 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 private sector or you know uh, are still calling the shots, and they are not uh, addressing some of the issues uh, which the farmers are suffering because of low low price and uh, high losses. And uh, this is where I was hoping you know 
the government must set in, must come in and uh, uh, commercialize agriculture in a way. Our agriculture is, is, is a small holding a subsistence business. You know? Sometimes they grow for the food and then they sell the balance, but that's not all. You know? We need to look at something like a commercial scale. Uh, we have the technology. We have a freedom of getting information now and the market is uh, available because everywhere is food shortage. And on top of that, because we lack the uh, uh, technology input in monitoring our data, for example, like the food balance sheet, I think this is something that we need to revisit back and use all those tools so that we can really detect you know, the losses and wastages. And make, you don't have to increase the land area in farming, just improve on the, uh, on the uh, losses and waste. You, know? you, you, you can bring down your food import bill and uh, you know, the farmers will benefit more you know, when most of the products are sold. So that's my message. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Azizi. Thank you. Mr. Sekar, your, your, you have the last word. <laughs> okay, all right. Yeah, it was really great uh, feeling that uh, you got me on the same stage where these wonderful speakers are there, especially my countryman, Dr. Michael. And uh, it was, it's, I hope uh, I've been able to reach uh, the farmers in Malaysia both rice farmers as well as plantation farmers, where it's a need, it's a need of the hour that those farmers become happy. Those farmers are able to fix carbon into their soils, whether it is rice farm or whether it is oil farm. It is possible, it is affordable, and it's very easy. It's very quick also. It doesn't take a long time. And this is the need of the hour for the global farmer. If we think that we need to have this is the decade of action. We have already started action nine years ago. So please take it, take whatever we have and use it for your farmers. Thank you. Thank you very much, my fellow, my panel speakers. You've been excellent. I really enjoy our discussion and hopefully we will meet again in person and uh, maybe have a better discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, for staying on on the session, we will see you uh, soon uh, in person, hopefully. Goodbye. Good night. Bye. Thank you very much. Stay safe. Thank, Thank you. you. Nice Bye.